Chapter 7 of The Chessmen of Mars by Edgar Rice Burroughs. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Thomas Copeland. Chapter 7 A Repellent Sight. The cruiser Vanator careened through the tempest. That she had not been dashed to the ground or twisted by the force of the elements into tangled wreckage was due entirely to the caprice of nature. For all the duration of the storm she rode a helpless derelict upon those storm-tossed waves of wind. But for all the dangers and vicissitudes they underwent, she and her crew might have borne charmed lives up to within an hour of the abating of the hurricane. It was then that the catastrophe occurred, a catastrophe indeed to the crew of the Vanator and the kingdom of Gathol. The men had been without food or drink since leaving Helium and they had been hurled about and buffeted in their lashings until all were worn to exhaustion. There was a brief lull in the storm, during which one of the crew attempted to reach his quarters, after releasing the lashings which had held him to the precarious safety of the deck. The act in itself was a direct violation of orders, and, in the eyes of the other members of the crew, the effect, which came with startling suddenness, took the form of a swift and terrible retribution. Scarce had the man released the safety snaps ere a swift arm of the storm monster encircled the ship, rolling it over and over, with the result that the foolhardy warrior went overboard at the first turn. Unloosed from their lashing by the constant turning and twisting of the ship and the force of the wind, the boarding and landing tackle had been trailing beneath the keel, a tangled mass of cordage and leather. Upon the occasions that the vanator rolled completely over, these things would be wrapped around her until another revolution in the opposite direction, or the wind itself, carried them once again clear of the deck, to trail whipping in the storm beneath the hurtling ship. Into this fell the body of the warrior, and as a drowning man clutches at a straw, so the fellow clutched at the tangled cordage that caught him and arrested his fall. With the strength of desperation he clung to the cordage, seeking frantically to entangle his legs and body in it. With each jerk of the ship his handholds were all but torn loose, and though he knew that eventually they would be, and that he must be dashed to the ground beneath, yet he fought with the madness that is born of hopelessness for the pitiful second which but prolonged his agony. It was upon this sight, then, the Gahan of Gothel looked over the edge of the careening deck of the Vanator, as he sought to learn the fate of his warrior. Lashed to the gunwale close at hand, a single landing leather that had not fouled the tangled mass beneath, whipped free from the ship's side, the hook snapping at its outer end. The jet of Gathol grasped the situation in a single glance. Below him, one of his people looked into the eyes of death. To the jet's hand lay the means for succor. There was no instant's hesitation. Casting off his death lashings, he seized the landing leather and slipped over the ship's side. Swinging like a bob upon a mad pendulum, he swung far out and back again, turning and twisting three thousand feet above the surface of Barsoom. And then, at last, the thing he had hoped for occurred. He was carried within reach of the cordage where the warrior still clung, though with rapidly diminishing strength. Catching one leg on a loop of the tangled strands, Gahan pulled himself close enough to seize another quite near to the fellow. Clinging precariously to this new hold, the Jed slowly drew in the landing leather, down which he had clambered, until he could grasp the hook at its end. This he fastened to a ring in the warrior's harness, just before the man's weakened fingers slipped from their hold upon the cordage. Temporarily, at least, he had saved the life of his subject, and now he turned his attention toward ensuring his own safety. Inextricably entangled in the mess to which he was clinging were numerous other landing hooks such as he had attached to the warrior's harness, and with one of these he sought to secure himself until the storm should abate sufficiently to permit him to climb to the deck. But even as he reached for one that swung near him, the ship was caught in a renewed burst of the storm's fury, the thrashing cordage whipped and snapped to the lunging of the great craft, and one of the heavy metal hooks, lashing through the air, struck the jet of Gathol fair between the eyes. Momentarily stunned, Gahan's fingers slipped from their hold upon the cordage, and the man shot downward through the thin air of dying Mars 
toward the ground three thousand feet beneath, while upon the deck of the rolling Vanator his faithful warriors clung to their lashings all unconscious of the fate of their beloved leader. Nor was it until more than an hour later, after the storm had materially subsided, that they realized he was lost, or knew the self-sacrificing heroism of the act that had sealed his doom. The Vanator now rested upon an even keel, as she was carried along by a strong, though steady, wind. The warriors had cast off their deck lashings, and the officers were taking account of losses and damage, when a weak cry was heard from oversides, attracting their attention to the man hanging in the cordage beneath the keel. Strong arms hoisted him to the deck, and then it was that the crew of the Vanator learned of the heroism of their Jed and his end. How far they had travelled since his loss they could only vaguely guess, nor could they return in search of him in the disabled condition of the ship. It was a saddened company that drifted onward through the air toward whatever destination fate was to choose for them. And Gahan, Jed of Gatho, what of him? Plummet-like he fell for a thousand feet, and then the storm seized him in its giant clutch and bore him far aloft again. As a bit of paper borne upon a gale, he was tossed about in mid-air, the sport and plaything of the wind. Over and over it turned him, and upward and downward it carried him. But, after each new sally of the element, he was brought nearer to the ground. The freaks of cyclonic storms are the rule of cyclonic storms, since such storms are in themselves freaks. They uproot and demolish giant trees, and, in the same gust, they transport frail infants for miles, and deposit them unharmed in their wake. And so it was with Gahan of Gathel. Expecting momentarily to be dashed to destruction, he presently found himself deposited gently upon the soft ochre moss of a dead sea bottom, bodily no worse off for his harrowing adventure than in the possession of a slight swelling upon his forehead where the metal hook had struck him. Scarcely able to believe that fate had dealt thus gently with him, the Jed arose slowly, as though more than half convinced that he should discover crushed and splintered bones that would not support his weight. But he was intact. He looked about him in a vain effort at orientation. The air was filled with flying dust and debris. The sun was obliterated. His vision was confined to a radius of a few hundred yards of ochre moss and dust-filled air. Five hundred yards away in any direction there might have arisen the walls of a great city, and he not known it. It was useless to move from where he was until the air cleared, since he could not know in what direction he was moving, and so he stretched himself upon the moss and waited, pondering the fate of his warriors and his ship, but giving little thought to his own precarious situation. Lashed to his harness were his swords, his pistols, and a dagger, and in his pocket pouch a small quantity of the concentrated rations that form a part of the equipment of the fighting men of Barsoom. These things, together with trained muscles, high courage, and an undaunted spirit, sufficed him for whatever misadventures might lie between him and Gatho, which lay in what direction he knew not, nor at what distance. The wind was falling rapidly, and with it the dust that obscured the landscape. That the storm was over he was convinced but he chafed at the inactivity the low visibility put upon him, nor did conditions better materially before night fell, so that he was forced to await the new day at the very spot at which the tempest had deposited him. Without his sleeping silks and furs he spent a far from comfortable night, and it was with feelings of unmixed relief that he saw the sudden dawn burst upon him. The air was now clear, and in the light of the new day, he saw an undulating plain stretching in all directions about him, while to the northwest there were barely discernible the outlines of low hills. Toward the southeast of Gathol was such a country, and as Gahan surmised the direction and the velocity of the storm to have carried him somewhere in the vicinity of the country he thought he recognized, he assumed that Gathol lay behind the hills he now saw, whereas in reality it lay far to the northeast. It was two days before Gahan had crossed the plain and reached the summit of the hills from which he hoped to see his own country, only to meet at last with disappointment. Before him stretched another plain, of even greater proportions than that he had just crossed, and beyond this 
other hills. In one material respect this plain differed from that behind him, in that it was dotted with occasional isolated hills. Convinced, however, that Gothel lay somewhere in the direction of his search, he descended into the valley and bent his steps toward the northwest. For weeks Gahan of Gothel crossed valleys and hills in search of some familiar landmark that might point his way toward his native land, but the summit of each succeeding ridge revealed but another unfamiliar view. He saw few animals and no men, until he finally came to the belief that he had fallen upon that fabled area of ancient Barsoom which lay under the curse of her olden gods, the once rich and fertile country whose people, in their pride and arrogance, had denied the deities and whose punishment had been extermination. And then one day he scaled low hills and looked into an inhabited valley, a valley of trees and cultivated fields and plots of ground, enclosed by stone walls surrounding strange towers. He saw people working in the fields, but he did not rush down to greet them. First he must know more of them, and whether they might be assumed to be friends or enemies. Hidden by concealing shrubbery, he crawled to a vantage point upon a hill that projected further into the valley, and here he lay upon his belly, watching the workers closest to him. They were still quite a distance from him, and he could not be quite sure of them, but there was something verging upon the unnatural about them. Their heads seemed out of proportion to their bodies, too large. For a long time he lay watching them, and ever more forcibly it was borne in upon his consciousness that they were not as he, and that it would be rash to trust himself among them. Presently he saw a couple appear from the nearest enclosure, and slowly approach those who were working nearest to the hill where he lay in hiding. Immediately he was aware that one of these differed from all the others. Even at the greater distance he noted that the head was smaller and as they approached he was confident that the harness of one of them was not as the harness of his companion or that of any of those who tilled the fields. The two stopped often, apparently in argument, as though one would proceed in the direction that they were going while the other demurred. But each time the smaller won reluctant consent from the other, and so they came closer and closer to the last line of workers toiling between the enclosure from which they had come and the hill where Gahan of Gathol lay watching, and then, suddenly, the smaller figure struck its companion full in the face. Gahan, horrified, saw the latter's head topple from its body, saw the body stagger and fall to the ground. The man half rose from his concealment, the better to view the happening in the valley below. The creature that had felled its companion was dashing madly in the direction of the hill upon which it was hidden. It dodged one of the workers that sought to seize it. Gahan hoped that it would gain its liberty, why he did not know, other than at close range it had every appearance of being a creature of his own race. Then he saw it stumble and go down, and instantly its pursuers were upon it. Then it was that Gahan's eyes chanced to return to the figure of the creature the fugitive had fell. What horror was this he was witnessing, or were his eyes playing some ghastly joke upon him? No, impossible though it was, it was true. The head was moving slowly to the fallen body. It placed itself upon the shoulders, the body rose, and the creature, seemingly as good as new, ran quickly to where its fellows were dragging the hapless captive to its feet. The watcher saw the creature take its prisoner by the arm and lead it back to the enclosure, and even across the distance that separated them from him he could note dejection and utter hopelessness in the bearing of the prisoner, and, too, he was half convinced that it was a woman, perhaps a red Martian of his own race. Could he be sure that this was true, he must make some effort to rescue her, even though the customs of his strange world required it only in case she was of his own country. But he was not sure. She might not be a red Martian at all. Or if she were, it was as possible that she sprang from an enemy people as not. His first duty was to return to his own people with as little personal risk as possible, and though the thought of adventure stirred his blood, he put the temptation aside with a sigh and turned away from the peaceful and beautiful valley that he longed to enter, for it was his intention to skirt its eastern edge and continue his search for Gathol beyond. 
As Gahan of Gathel turned his steps along the southern slopes of the hills that bound Bontum on the south and east, his attention was attracted toward a small cluster of trees a short distance to his right. The low sun was casting long shadows. It would soon be night. The trees were off the path that he had chosen, and he had little mind to be diverted from his way, but as he looked again he hesitated. There was something there besides boles of trees and underbrush. There were suggestions of familiar lines of the handicraft of man. The Han stopped and strained his eyes in the direction of the thing that had arrested his attention. No, he must be mistaken. The branches of the trees and a low bush had taken on an unnatural semblance in the horizontal rays of the setting sun. He turned and continued upon his way, but as he cast another side glance in the direction of the object of his interest, the sun's rays were shot back into his eyes from a glistening point of radiance among the trees. Gahan shook his head and walked quickly toward the mystery, determined now to solve it. The shining object still lured him on, and when he had come closer to it, his eyes went wide in surprise, for the thing they saw was naught else than the jewel-encrusted emblem upon the prow of a small flyer. Gahan, his hand upon his short sword, moved silently forward. But as he neared the craft he saw that he had not to fear, for it was deserted. Then he turned his attention toward the emblem. As its significance was flashed to his understanding, his face paled and his heart went cold. It was the insignia of the house of the warlord of Barsoom. Instantly he saw the dejected figure of the captive being led back to her prison in the valley just beyond the hills. Tara of Helium! and he had been so near to deserting her to her fate. The cold sweat stood in beads upon his brow. A hasty examination of the deserted craft unfolded to the young Jed the whole tragic story. The same tempest that had proved his undoing had borne Tara of Helium to this distant country. Here, doubtless, she had landed in hope of obtaining food and water, since without a propeller she could not hope to reach her native city, or any other friendly port, other than by the merest caprice of fate. The flyer seemed intact except for the missing propeller, and the fact that it had been carefully moored in the shelter of the clump of trees indicated that the girl had expected to return to it, while the dust and leaves upon its deck spoke of the long days and even weeks since she had landed. Mute yet eloquent proofs these things that Tara of Helium was a prisoner, and that she was the very prisoner whose bold dash for liberty he had so recently witnessed, he now had not the slightest doubt. The question now revolved solely about her rescue. He knew to which tower she had been taken, that much and no more. Of the number, the kind, or the disposition of her captors he knew nothing, nor did he care, for Tara of Helium he would face a hostile world alone. Rapidly he considered several plans for succoring her, but the one that appealed most strongly to him was that which offered the greatest chance of escape for the girl, should he be successful in reaching her. His decision reached, he turned his attention quickly toward the flyer. Casting off its lashings, he dragged it out from beneath the trees, and mounting to the deck, tested out the various controls. The motor started at a touch and purred sweetly, the buoyancy tanks were well stocked, and the ship answered perfectly to the controls which regulated her altitude. There was nothing needed but a propeller to make her fit for the long voyage to Helium. Gahan shrugged impatiently. There must not be a propeller within a thousand hods. But what mattered it? The craft, even without a propeller, would still answer the purpose his plan required of it, provided the captors of Terra of Helium were a people without ships, and he had seen nothing to suggest that they had ships. The architecture of the towers and enclosures assured him that they had not. The sudden Barsoomian night had fallen. Chloros rode majestically the high heavens. The rumbling roar of a banth reverberated among the hills. Gahan of Gathol let the ship rise a few feet from the ground. Then, seizing a bow rope, he dropped over the side. To tow the little craft was now a thing of ease, and as Gahan moved rapidly toward the brow of the hill above Bontum, the flyer floated behind him as lightly as a swan upon a quiet lake. Now, down the hill, toward the tower, dimly visible in the moonlight, the Gatholian turned his steps. Closer behind him sounded the roar of the hunting band. 
He wondered if the beast sought him or was following some other spoor. He could not be delayed now by any hungry beast of prey, for what might that very instant be befalling Tara of Helium he could not guess, and so he hastened his steps. But closer and closer came the horrid screams of the great carnivore, and now he heard the swift fall of padded feet upon the hillside behind him. He glanced back just in time to see the beast break into a rapid charge. His hand leaped to the hilt of his long sword, but he did not draw, for in the same instant he saw the futility of armed resistance, since behind the first band came a herd of at least a dozen others. There was but a single alternative to a futile stand, and that he grasped in the instant that he saw the overwhelming numbers of his antagonists. Springing lightly from the ground, he swarmed up the rope toward the bow of the flyer. His weight drew the craft slightly lower, and at the very instant that the man drew himself to the deck at the bow of the vessel, the leading band sprang for the stern. Gahan leaped to his feet and rushed toward the great beast in the hope of dislodging it before it had succeeded in clambering aboard. At the same instant he saw that others of the bands were racing toward them with a quite evident intention of following their leader to the ship's deck. Should they reach it in any numbers, he would be lost. There was but a single hope. Leaping for the altitude control, Gahan pulled it wide. Simultaneously, three bands leaped for the deck. The craft rose swiftly. Gahan felt the impact of a body against the keel, followed by the soft thuds of the great bodies as they struck the ground beneath. His act had not been an instant too soon, and now the leader had gained the deck and stood at the stern with glaring eyes and snarling jaws. Gahan drew his sword. The beast, possibly disconcerted by the novelty of its position, did not charge. Instead, it crept slowly toward its intended prey. The craft was rising, and Gahan placed a foot upon the control and stopped the ascent. He did not wish to chance rising to some higher air current that would bear him away. Already the craft was moving slowly toward the tower, carried thither by the impetus of the band's heavy body leaping upon it from astern. The man watched the slow approach of the monster, the slavering jowls, the malignant expression of the devilish face. The creature, finding the deck stable, appeared to be gaining confidence, and then the man leaped suddenly to one side of the deck, and the tiny flyer heeled as suddenly in response. The band slipped and clutched frantically at the deck. Gahan leaped in with his naked sword. The great beast caught itself and reared upon its hind legs to reach forth and seize this presumptuous mortal that dared question its right to the flesh it craved. And then the man sprang to the opposite side of the deck. The banth toppled sideways at the same instant that it attempted to spring. A raking talon passed close to Cahan's head at the moment that his sword lunged through the savage heart, and as the warrior wrenched his blade from the carcass, it slipped silently over the side of the ship. A glance below showed that the vessel was drifting in the direction of the tower to which Gahan had seen the prisoner led. In another moment or two, it would be directly over it. The man sprang to the control and let the craft drop quickly toward the ground, where followed the bands, still hot for their prey. To land outside the enclosure spelled certain death, while inside he could see many forms huddled upon the ground as in sleep. The ship floated now but a few feet above the wall of the enclosure. There was nothing for it but to risk all on a bold bid for fortune, or drift helplessly past without hope of returning through the banth-infested valley, from many points of which he could now hear the roars and growls of these fierce Barsoomian lions. Slipping over the side, Gahan descended by the trailing anchor rope until his feet touched the top of the wall where he had no difficulty in arresting the slow drifting of the ship. Then he drew up the anchor and lowered it inside the enclosure. Still there was no movement upon the part of the sleepers beneath. They lay as dead men. Dull lights shone from openings in the tower, but there was no sign of guard or waking inmate. Clinging to the rope, Cahan lowered himself within the enclosure where he had his first close view of the creatures lying there in what he had thought sleep. With a half-smothered exclamation of horror, the man drew back from the headless bodies of the Rikors. At first he thought them the corpses of decapitated humans like himself, which was quite bad enough, but when he saw them move and realized that they were endowed with life, 
his horror and disgust became even greater. Here, then, was the explanation of the thing he had witnessed that afternoon, when Tara of Helium had struck the head from her captor, and Gahan had seen the head crawl back to its body. And to think that the pearl of Helium was in the power of such hideous things as these! Again the man shuddered, but he hastened to make fast the flyer, clamber again to its deck, and lower it to the floor of the enclosure. Then he strode toward a door in the base of the tower, stepping lightly over the recumbent forms of the unconscious Rikors, and, crossing the threshold, disappeared within. End of chapter 7 Recording by Thomas Copeland